There are still a lot of seats over there who are empty. So if you go through to this side, that would be good. And still, there are seats over there which are empty. So if you go over there, and we can only start once you are sitting because of the fire department who is saying we have to be sitting. So maybe I should sit. Welcome to our next keynote. First of all, and I hope most of you know it already, you can ask questions to the keynote speaker by using Slido. So if you go with your uh, device to slide.do, which you also see over there, and you enter the event code OOP MOOC, you can ask questions and vote for questions you really think they are important to the keynote speaker. Which brings me to the keynote speaker. So the thing is, what Florian says, is that a lot of things that we have to do right now or that we are doing right now, we can't do anymore with like regular computers because the simulations are just too, too big, take too much time, too much space, and all of that. And therefore, quantum computing is the resolution. However, what I'm really curious about is how to make it practical, and this is what you want to focus on. So, welcome, Florian Neukert. So, thanks for the very warm welcome. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, very happy to have the opportunity to talk about quantum computing today. And, um, Hopefully, um, so this talk is for you, hopefully you can take or get something out of it. So let me start with um, talking about the people who are active in quantum computing. So I would say there are mainly two groups. So there are the ones who are serious about it and the ones who are dead serious about it. <laughs> so the ones who are dead serious about it, I would say, are those who build chips, um, work on theoretical algorithms, are interested in supremacy experiments. Supremacy is the one thing that everyone in quantum computing is interested in. So you want to do that one calculation that only a quantum computer can do and a classical computer. And anytime I say classical computer, it's a computer that's not a quantum computer, so like a laptop or a data center or the cloud. Um, so you're interested in this one calculation that a classical computer can never finish in finite time. So something that you can only do with a quantum computer. And I would say we belong to the other group, so we are also very serious about quantum computing. We think this is a revolution in information technology. Um, but um, we're also interested in doing things that you can do with classical computers, but maybe you can do it a little faster. Maybe you can do a calculation and get a more accurate result. So even if you can solve it with a classical machine, as an industrial company, we may have some benefit or get some benefit out of it. Um, I structured today's talk in two main 
segments you could say. So the first is I will give you a very brief introduction to quantum theory and how you can use it for computation. And uh, the second part um, comprises practical examples. So I always need an example when I want to understand things. So I thought maybe um, it helps to transport what I want to transport. So I explained what quantum computing could be used for and uh, how it's useful in industry. Um, as I promised, we'll start with some quantum theory. Not too much. So after this talk, um, we will also have the chance to, um, or I have the chance to, to do a master class. So we will go in depth um, in this master class. So talk about um, what, what this postulates of quantum mechanics. Talk in more detail about the effects that are relevant for quantum computing and how you can use it for computation. So this is a brief overview. So you could say it's an intro to the master class. Um, <clears throat> so what I always like to start with is this very nice picture. So this picture shows Laniakea, which is our local supercluster of galaxies. So in here on the bottom left corner, um, or bottom right corner from your side, um, this is where you usually, or where you find our galaxy, the Milky Way. So it's pretty big, so it's about 160 megaparsecs in diameter, and, uh, or 520 million light years. And uh, you may wonder what's that got to do with quantum um, effects or quantum computing in general. So about 13.8 billion years ago, when our universe was really, really small, so about Planck size, so this is the size you usually um, um, start talking about when you talk about quantum effects, so where classical ideas of space-time and classical ideas of gravity cease to exist, where quantum effects become relevant. So the Planck um, length, um, I would say, is uh, about 10 to the negative 35 meters, so really, really small. And then there's Planck time, which is the time it takes a photon to traverse this distance um, at the speed of light. So, and this is where we um, start thinking about quantum effects. But still, um, now that our universe is really big, still quantum effects play a, um, a very important role. So, anytime you think about stars, how they emit radiation, anytime um, radiation is absorbed or emitted by the interstellar medium, so that's something where quantum effects become relevant. So still, you see, everything around us, everything is based on quantum physics. Everything is based on quantum theory. So and that's why I always like to start with this picture, so we get an awareness of, of quantum physics. It's, it's everywhere. So and here are some more, um, some more examples. So how you could use quantum theory or where it's used. So interesting examples comprise the use in medicine. So you can imagine quantum nanoparticles attaching to cells and absorbing specific frequencies of radiation only. So you could then uh, use that for um, scanning bodies so, and learn something about diseases. Um, another thing that's very interesting, of course, is quantum computing. So how to leverage quantum effects for computation. So how can we achieve a benefit um, by using quantum effects, how can we solve problems that, that you have difficulty solving or that you can't solve at all with today's computers? And we're fairly certain there are some problems that you will never be able to solve, even in um, how many years, whatever. It's impossible. It's too complex. So and I know in computer science, lots of people in the past said something is impossible, but here we're, we're fairly certain it is. So other things that are very interesting to look at when it comes to quantum computing is material science. So here, um, anytime you want to simulate electronic structure, anytime you want to um, understand the behavior of a molecule or subatomic or atomic particles, quantum effects become relevant. So, and uh, the best idea um, people had was maybe, in, so in theory, back in the 80s already, the best idea people had was maybe use one quantum system to simulate another quantum system. So that, that's what considered to be the, um, the killer app of quantum computing. So do exact calculations or simulations of, of molecules and atoms, which is a very complicated problem, but we'll talk about this in a bit. Um, lasers. So lasers only function because we know how to leverage quantum physics. So some small examples here. And one more um, that, that you may all know is using your toaster. So you know, um, your toaster, when you look at that heat element, it glows red. So, and it turns out at specific temperatures, um, if a material survives it, if you heat it up, then it um, doesn't matter um, what substance it is, it all emits, all of the materials at this certain temperature emit um, in the same spectrum of light. So, and uh, that was very interesting. So physicists about 100, 120 years ago started thinking about this, and um, then there was a problem. So the problem is, so when you have higher frequencies, there are more ways to emit higher frequency radiation. So, and uh, if that would be the case, according to the theories they had back then, 
um, then our toasters would emit X-rays and gamma rays, and we were very happy that it, it doesn't happen, right? So in our kitchen. So um, and there was a solution to that. So and then some people have invented quantum theory and said light can only be emitted in certain quanta. So, and uh, that's how everything started. <clears throat> so to put this in more concrete terms, so there are four forces in physics, or the fundamental forces, that are interesting. So there is the electromagnetic force. There is the weak force, which governs some um, forms of radioactive decay. Then there is the strong force holding the nuclei together. And then there is gravity. And for three of these forces, um, people have found theories that allow you to unite these with quantum theory. For the first one, so for gravity, it's not, not done yet. So it's still an open problem. So if anyone has ideas, let's talk after that. Um, so uh, each of these three forces, so I'm a computer scientist by education. So each of these three forces, we can say this is um, a higher level language, right? And uh, everything. Um, um, Beneath these higher level languages, so the machine code, so to say, is quantum theory. So higher level languages sitting on top of quantum theory, and we're fairly certain with quantum uh, with, with gravity, it will happen as well. Probably some PhD student finding it, um, and not big research organizations. So and in, in physics, people usually don't call these higher level languages, but we use uh, different names. So like quantum electrodynamics, quantum chromodynamics. But still, um, as computer scientists, we may think about it as, as higher level languages. So and what are the programs? So the programs are initial configurations of these systems, force fields or fields and such. So and this is the same with quantum computers. You start in a well-defined state, a state that you understand, and then you execute an evolution. So you evolve the state over time by um, interacting with it. Not too much, because if you interact too much, then we have a problem. We'll see that later. So it's called um, the decoherence. So from all this rich information that you would have in a quantum state, you would lose everything but one. So um, ideally, um, we can learn something about our problem or even solve the problem by not interacting too much. So that's what we're going to talk about a bit more. Um, <clears throat> so for this, I want to give you a brief overview of quantum effects that are relevant for quantum computing. And, um, before that, so there is a challenging statement here, so it says Moore's law becomes obsolete. So I put this here um, to say exactly that, but in reality, right now, we're not fairly certain if this is really going to happen. So, but <clears throat> the idea behind all that is, so you know what Moore's law is? Uh, it just says it doubles, you double the feature size on a silicon chip every two years, so you, know, you increase the computational power. But if you extrapolate this to the year 2050, um, you would act or operate on molecular or atomic computers. And if you don't want computers that get really, really hot or very difficult to handle, we need to find some other ways to do computation and increase computational power. And this is quantum computing. So this is where we start using quantum computers. Um, the effects that are relevant. Let's start with superposition. So imagine in the classical information theory or classical computer science, um, the smallest unit of information is a bit, right? So if you look at this bit, this bit can take two values, 0 or 1. If you look at it, it's still 0 or 1, doesn't matter. And uh, the same is true for strings of bits. So at any given time, I can know um, which value the string of bits has. So it doesn't matter if I look at it or if I don't look at it. So easy. But it's different in quantum computing. So in quantum computing, you have a direct contact to physics. Um, when you operate on bits. So and you could say, I take an electron spin, for example, an electron spin representing my bit. I could say spin up is 1, spin down is 0. And uh, the interesting thing is, as long as I don't look at it, um, and depending on the implementation of your quantum bit, this can be interacting, looking at it, can be interacting with magnetic fields, can be firing polarized laser light at it. As long as you don't look at it, you are in a superposition of states. So every possible configuration, like 0 and 1, is associated with a probability, a probability amplitude, to be more specific. Um, but it is in both at once, so to say. Not really, but it helps us to understand. So I have 0 and 1 at once. And what this means is, imagine you have two bits. Um, and uh, each of these two bits can take two values, 0 and 1, right? So then you have 2 to the power of 2 equals 4 possible configurations that you can evaluate in one function call in a superposition. If you have three bits, you have 2, because two configurations and three bits. 2 to the power of 3 equals 8 possible configurations that you can evaluate at once. So and, uh, this is already a fundamental property of quantum computers. So you see, when you add a bit, you double the computational power. This is not a class, or there is no classical equivalent to that. <clears throat> 
But superposition alone, without interaction with other bits, um, doesn't help me too much. So I want, I want more. So and this more is entanglement. So and you may have heard about this. So Einstein once called it spooky action over distance. Um, but entanglement just means you can correlate bits. So imagine you have two bits, one bit here and one bit there. Um, then you can entangle them or correlate them such that if I do something to that bit, something happens to that bit. I want this bit to be one and this bit to be one as well, if that one is one. Or I want this bit to be one and that one zero, if that is one. So these are the interactions that you can, can add. So you can entangle them. And uh, you can do that with as many bits as you want. So depending on the chip architecture, so we're talking about theory here, depending on the chip architecture, um, it's more challenging. So if you work on real hardware, because right now you can't entangle as many bits as you want. But in theory, so and hopefully at some point we'll have chips that are fully um, connected. So you can entangle every bit with every other bit. But right now we're not there. And the interesting thing with this is, so just from a physics point of view, if you have this bit here and the other one, I don't know, over there, so five meters apart, if you do something to that bit, the interaction is instantaneous without time delay. So immediately after I do something to that bit, it happens to the other bit. And if the other bit is in Andromeda galaxy, it doesn't matter either. So still instantaneous. So and, uh, that's why it's maybe a little spooky. And um, <clears throat> so the last effect we're going to talk about is tunneling. So I don't have a picture here. I had it in some other presentation, but somehow it's, it's lost. So <laughs> um, the tunneling is um, another effect that you could use for computations of a special purpose computers called quantum annealing systems. And uh, this is, uh, so imagine you have a cliffy surface or a hilly surface. So you have some um, hills and valleys. And uh, this surface represents or represents solutions to your problem. So you could say good solutions are in the valleys and bad solutions are on, on top of the hills. So what a classical, so a non-quantum algorithm can do is, of course, you can parallelize. But what you do is you start walking this surface. So and uh, you can then end up in a valley. And like, you can make the assumption this is the deepest valley, but you don't know. So then we have some tricks. We give the um, algorithm a kick. So it jumps over and maybe it just tries to walk another hill, and maybe it finds a deeper valley, and you can parallelize. You can say, I want to start at 1,000 points at once. And of course, the surface is not only three-dimensional, it's n-dimensional. Um, and with tunneling, it's a little different, because in tunneling, so you imagine you have um, an energy barrier, and you have a particle flying or hitting this energy barrier. In our classical world, it's impossible. Like when I, or it's very unlikely, when I touch this table, that I just grab through the table. But the smaller we become, so we have heard about wave and particle dualism, so the smaller we become, the more wave-like behavior of particles becomes. And uh, when that happens, there's a chance that it just tunnels through this energy barrier. And uh, so this means I can just fly through my landscape. And uh, ideally, if I formulate my problem correctly, I can end up in the deepest valley uh, without walking the surface, but with flying through the surface, and so find the best solution to a problem, to an optimization problem that I have. So these are the three effects. There are more, um, but these are the three effects that, that we consider to be relevant for quantum computing. So the next question that we need to ask ourselves, so all this is very interesting, but does it help us as a, as a company? So what can we do with it? And um, so we already learned quantum computers are fundamentally different to classical computers, but many of the world's most interesting and most pressing problems you will, you will not be able to solve with classical machines, or at least will take some time until you have solutions that you really want. So one of the problems or problem classes that are very interesting is transportation and logistics. It's interesting because very often these problems are time critical optimization problems. So you want to find a solution that's the optimal solution or a solution that's good enough, whatever good enough means, um, in very short time. And uh, you can very often do this with classical machines, but you have to do it with tricks. So you must make some assumptions, kick some possible solutions out, but maybe you kick a good solution out, so you don't want to do that, right? So ideally, I can do my evaluation on the whole solution space and uh, hopefully find a solution that is good enough in, in very short time. An example, or a couple of examples that we did have to do with mobility and transportation. So when we look at traffic flow optimization, when we look at the optimization of taxi fleet, how do you minimize the waiting time for potential customers given a limited amount of taxes, how do you ideally spread it? And I want to calculate this really fast. So I don't want to do that once in an hour. I want to do it maybe once every five seconds. Because once every five seconds, this would be the interval that we have for collecting position information of vehicles. 
Um, artificial intelligence and neuroscience is another area that could be interesting or is interesting. So in machine learning, you know, um, lots of the problems that we have, um, we try to tackle with very complex algorithms. So like any convolutional network for computer vision. So, but still, we have to work with tricks to make these algorithms work. Um, and one thing to look at with these algorithms is take the classical algorithm and uh, see if you can take a part of it, the very complex part. In terms of a neural network, it would be searching the weight space. Can I take this and map it on a quantum chip? Can I do a quantum neural network? Or can I, can I just sample from a distribution with the quantum chip? If that's possible, then I may have an advantage. By the way, when you look at these quantum chips, it doesn't matter which architecture it is, and we'll talk about two architectures in a bit. It doesn't matter um, uh, uh, when you look at them, which architecture it is, they all look very similar. You have your bits, and you have connections between these bits. So and, uh, if you worked in machine learning, then just by looking at it, it it's a graph which is very similar or shares some um, fundamental properties of neural networks. So the idea that you immediately get is, can I embed a neural network on this chip? So And that's also the question uh, we ask. And the other thing, so with quantum effects, where you might think quantum effects play a role, is in your brain. So is maybe conscious perception based on quantum physics? Everything else is based on quantum physics, so why? Why not our brain? So it's a question that's, that's not answered yet. So, and I will not speculate here, because so I don't want to drift away from our um, original topic. So then simulated physics and uh, material science. So anytime you want to simulate atoms, anytime you want to simulate molecules and get a better understanding of materials properties, then quantum um, computing could be interesting. And in medicine, because it's very similar, right? So what you want to understand is um, how um, certain drugs um, act on your body, act on molecules or, or protein chains. So that's also something you, you could simulate with a quantum machine. So we'll briefly look at um, the difference between two um, models, gate model computers or universal quantum computers and quantum annealing systems. So what you see here, so your left-hand side, um, is um, the description, very brief description, so we'll talk about it in the, in the master class in more detail if you're interested, but it's the problem that it can solve. So it can only solve one problem, but if you can take your real-world problem and map it to this one single problem, then you may have an advantage. So here, all the Qs in this equation represent quantum bits. So here on the um, right side, QI, QJ, means the interaction between two quantum bits. It's like this graph that we just talked about. So you have two qubits and you have an interaction term. How strong do they interact? Is this BIJ? And then you have your diagonal terms. So it's a big matrix when you look at that. So you present your problem as a matrix. So programming a quantum annealing system means creating an energy matrix. So creating that matrix, and that is something that you can... It's called a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem because you work with binaries. But that can be translated to um, something that's very well known in physics. It's an Ising spin model. So spin model is, you know, spin up and down, so as we had with the electrons before. So, and we can take this, this quadratic, um, this cue ball problem and embed it on a Ising, or change it, translate it to an Ising spin model and then embed it on a quantum chip. And let's see if we can find a solution out of, so out of this big matrix here. Um, the other model that's interesting is um, gate model computers or universal quantum computers. So the name already implies it. Um, a universal quantum computer can not only solve one problem, so it can solve any arbitrarily complex algorithmic problem. So anything that you want it to solve, it should be able to solve. And of course, we don't need to solve everything because there are classical computers that do a good job in solving some of the problems that we already work on, but then there are others, so like material simulation, we, we may want to have a closer look at. So, and, uh, <coughs> The other name, gate model computer, comes from the fact that um, you don't create a big matrix, but you stack together gates, gate operations, like you know from classical computer science, um, like the NOT gate, controlled NOT, AND OR gates. And there are more complex ones. So actually, there is an infinite number of possible gates, because what we're dealing with is complex numbers and rotations on a complex sphere, but we don't need an infinite number. So we, we only work with a few gates that could be interesting. So let's look at one example gate, which is this one. So it's the Hadamard transformation. So the language of quantum computing is linear algebra. So you work with matrices a lot. And uh, this Hadamard transformation, so look in on the right side here, there's one square root of half um, and the matrix. So applied to a quantum bit, um, it lifts it in a superposition. So this first quantum effect that we talked about before. So when I say Hadamard applied to zero, then in reality it means I apply this matrix 
to a vector zero. So the bit zero or the quantum state zero is represented as one zero the vector. The quantum state one is represented as zero one. So and the result that you get, depending on which um, bit you apply it to, uh, or which state you apply it to, is a, an equally weighted superposition. So half probability that when I look at it, so this looking at it is the crucial part again, so that when I look at it, it collapses either into zero or one. But as long as I don't look into, at it, so I interact with it with some um, um, transformations, so I can execute operations on both bit states at once. So instead of doing it classically, execute the operation on zero and execute it on one, or a more complex string, which is then even more operations, I operate or execute this transformation on this superposition. Yeah? So and there is no meaningful um, transformation in classical bits that can do that right now. So, but in quantum computer science, so and combined with other operations, it could be very useful. <coughs> so in talking about usefulness, so we, we want to talk about quantum supremacy again. So this one experiment where you, you do something that only a quantum computer can do, or proof that a quantum computer can solve a problem that a classical machine cannot solve. So as an industrial company, we're interested in useful quantum supremacy. So what we want to do is solve a problem, a real-world problem, not some artificial mathematical problem, a real-world problem that we cannot solve yet, and uh, um, then show that with a quantum chip, we can do it a lot better, or, or even, as I said, solve it, which could be electronic structure calculations, so material simulation. So there is this, this famous example with a caffeine molecule, which is not too complex a molecule, but still, it will never be possible, is the assumption today, and I'm careful with saying never, now I already said it. <laughs> so um, that you will never be able to simulate that exactly with a classical computer. So the idea is, with a quantum computer, if it's an error-corrected, quantum computer, so error is another problem that we have with, with gate model chips. If it's an error-corrected quantum computer, then we would need about 160 qubits to do this exact simulation. So right now, we're somewhere between 72, and maybe some companies have a little more for gate model chips and for quantum annealing systems. The special purpose computers, we have um, 2,000 um, qubits that we can access, and uh, soon to be seen more, so up to 5,000 qubits. So and, uh, this already allows us to do something that could be useful. So this, this classification is not something that we invented. It's, it's commonly used. Um, well, this up to 50 physical qubits is not um, correct anymore. So right now we have more, so it's 72 um, that we know of. Um, but still, there is this um, classification where you can say it can distinguish between types of algorithm and uh, types of data. So when we look at the upper left corner, the CC corner, from your side, then what this means is I take classical data, like in traffic flow optimization, I collect position information of vehicles, and then I have some classical, a classical algorithm that solves it for me. So how do I optimally distribute my vehicles such that the travel time from A to B for each of the um, drivers in that traffic graph in the city is minimized under consideration of all the other vehicles? So it's a very complex combinatorial optimization problem. So and, uh, we have a classical problem and a classical algorithm that we use. So Different is when we switch over to CQ, then um, this is what we tried. We take classical data and somehow make it quantum and solve it with a quantum chip. And uh, the killer use case is down here, quantum quantum. So you initialize something um, on a quantum chip. So maybe at some point it's possible to initialize some, some complex molecule simulations directly on a quantum chip. So we are operating on quantum data directly and uh, solve it with a quantum chip and a quantum algorithm that we have. <clears throat> because right now, so we must be honest, right now, if we look at the CQ problems here, so of course you may get a result, so something that allows you or shows you that with the quantum chip, once I have the problem, once I have it embedded on the chip, I can solve it in five nanoseconds or maybe one second. But still, what we look at is, uh, is, it, is the whole processing um, time. So when I have my, my original data I collected, I need to apply all the transformations such that I can embed it on the chip and then get the solution and interpret the classical result. So this is what we're really interested in. Um, so I'll skip over to some of the things or some of the practical examples that I, I promised you to talk about. And then I see we, we're nearing the end of the talk already. So um, the first thing is quantum annealing systems, so optimization problems I want to briefly talk about. 
Um, so what we did was traffic flow optimization, as I mentioned before, then we did some, some reinforcement learning. So how can we use a reinforcement learning algorithm and, and make it somehow quantum that we get a benefit by solving it with a quantum chip? So what we did was finding the optimal policy. But I'll get to that in a bit. And uh, maybe for the clustering, we exploited um, specific topology of a quantum chip. So when you look at it, you know, it's, it's like a neural network. So we, we create an algorithm that resembles a self-organizing feature map, so an algorithm that you can use for clustering problems. And for um, the gate model, we're still working on same optimization problems, machine learning, simulating physics, and um, um, yeah, hopefully there is a lot more to come. Uh, I think I will not go into too much detail with all the things that we did. I will, so for each of the uh, examples I have here, I will explain one in, in detail. So starting with this traffic flow optimization. So how do you represent this problem? So you collect position information of vehicles. How do you represent it such that you can solve it with a quantum chip? So remember, you have to express it as a big matrix. So and, uh, what we did was um, you need to to collect, of course, the position information. But then one way to do it would use a quantum bit as vehicle. So every vehicle is a quantum bit. And the interaction with other vehicles is these interaction terms that we just talked about before. But it turns out that it's too complex. So we made another assumption. We made the assumption that um, we can segment uh, roads. And uh, we take a time slice, let's say three minutes, four minutes. And uh, we count the number of vehicles per time slice on a road segment. And uh, the quantity that we want to minimize is the number of vehicles on a road segment per time slice. So and, uh, this is a very nice um, example for combining quantum chips or quantum computing with classical algorithms. Because if you do that real time, so then there is no way. If I know right now we have too many vehicles or vehicles causing a traffic jam here, how should I distribute them that the traffic jam doesn't happen? So what we did was we use a classical algorithm and make a prediction. So we predict 15 minutes ahead where we would see traffic jam um, with a high probability, and then take these vehicles that we assume to contribute to traffic jam and redistribute them such that the traffic jam doesn't happen at all. And this redistribution, this is done quantumly. So find the optimal configurations of all the vehicles, so that minimizes this road occupancy, so how many vehicles per road segment, um, so that um, even when I take 100 vehicles here and I put them here, I don't want to cause traffic jam here. This is happening, or this happens with some of the navigation systems you know. So it's traffic jam, and uh, then they send 300 vehicles to, um, to the right of the highway, and then uh, all of a sudden you have traffic jam here. So that's not what we want. We want to find the distribution such that traffic jam is, does not happen at all, which is not always possible, but we can make this better. So. This is a very similar problem. Um, and I just want to give you an intuition so how you can use quantum chips and what you can do. So here, um, if you think about one problem and have one problem in mind, like this traffic flow optimization, then you can translate that into all the other problems. So you can say this taxi fleet prediction or optimization, this is very similar to traffic flow, because what you have is a couple of people waiting for taxis. And again, you want to minimize um, their waiting time. So what we do classically, again, is predict where we expect people to wait for taxis, and then take an available number of taxis and distribute them such that the waiting time is minimized. So again, what you could say is instead of distributing vehicles on different routes, I distribute vehicles to different demand hotspots, so where I predict people to wait. So and maybe the result is that instead of one group of people waiting 10 minutes and another group of people waiting two minutes, the result could be one group of people waiting six minutes and the other one four or three. So um, that's better. But still, um, one may gain, one may lose. But still, consider it um, um, on the quantity that we want to minimize, which is the time, the overall time, it minimizes, um, it, it finds the minimum value solution. So. And maybe one last thing um, in terms of quantum annealing systems, so then we'll skip over to, to gate model chips, is reinforcement learning, so which is also a very interesting problem. So you know, reinforcement learning, what you do is um, you want an algorithm learned from observations. So um, let's take a parking maneuver. So I have a parking maneuver of vehicles, so, and I want to find the optimal parking maneuver, so, or the vehicle to learn to optimally park, so given any situation. So what you could do is, Take a driver and uh, let him or her um, execute one million parking maneuvers and record everything. Anytime he or she hits the hydrant, anytime the vehicle is not ideally positioned, you say that's bad behavior. I don't give it a good reward, I give it a negative reward. 
But then you could say, if I have good behavior, so optimal parking maneuver executed successfully, then I could say I give it a good reward. So and, uh, these are the observations that we learn in reinforcement learning. We learn it from. So and what we learn from is the optimal policy. So the optimal behavior given observations, and ideally the optimal behavior given any um, situation in the real world. So and, uh, the next thing what you could do is, instead of letting um, one guy execute one million parking maneuvers, is let the software simulate behavior. So I simulated one million times, which is a lot faster, and learn from these observations. So and that's what we did. So we, we learned from simulated um, um, behavior. And uh, what we initially wanted to do is um, use a quantum chip and embed all these observations and get, give us the optimal policy, because it's, again, an optimization problem. But it turns out, um, so either we formulated the problem incorrectly um, or uh, something else went wrong. So it turns out that the quantum chip in that case acts as a sort of filter. So imagine I have one million observations. And I embed these one million observations on the chip, and then the chip, what, what it would do now in our classical Im or in our actual implementation, is um, filter out, always filter out two thirds of the observations and give us back 300,000 in that case, around 300,000. So and if I use that as an input to a classical algorithm that finds the optimal policy, I get a result that's equally good as if I would use one million observations. So you could use the chip as a sort of filter. Um, that kicks out everything that is irrelevant for calculating the optimal policy and so execute this problem classically a lot faster, which is a, a big thing in reinforcement learning. So you want to only take the, the episodes or the observations that are relevant for, for solving a specific problem. <clears throat> so then let me quickly skip over that. Um, so for gate model chips, but still, this is quantum annealing. Um, but for gate model chips, the, the thing that we hope we can achieve um, is electronic structure calculations. So this is the thing. So imagine you want to simulate a molecule. What you have to do is, so you have atomic nuclei. You have electrons surrounding it in certain probability distributions. And uh, you have all these interactions that you have to consider. You have electrons interaction interacting with other electrons by Coulomb interaction. So you have atomic nuclei attracting electrons. So, and uh, classically, this is a very complex problem. So, if you, even if you just add one electron, it becomes exponentially more complex. So, and uh, classically, what you can do is you can make some assumptions. I can say the nuclei don't move. So, in reality, they do move. They're just a lot slower than the electrons. So, but we make some assumptions. And uh, this is what we do classically. So, once the problem becomes too complex, maybe 1,000, 1,500 electrons, we make assumptions and simulate or approximate. That's what we do. But ideally, what you want to do is simulate exactly. I don't want to make assumptions. I want to do exact simulations. So I use that one quantum system to simulate another quantum system. So, and that's what we're, we're interested in. And uh, we could show, so with quantum annealing systems, it's also possible. Actually, we, we showed that we can implement it. So another guy um, from Purdue University, Saber Kais, he um, came up with a possible implementation and published that and said, hey, I think this could be done on a quantum annealing system. And uh, we took this publication and uh, showed that it's possible to do on a quantum annealing system. And there's always four steps um, involved in this um, structure calculations, which is, so you take your initial problem um, and uh, review it with the complexity. So you make it a little easier. Um, but what you need to do then um, is to add additional um, quantum bits. So the more complex the problem is and uh, the um, greater your simplification is, the more additional qubits you need to execute your calculations. Or you say it's auxiliary qubits, helper qubits. And um, um, that's a problem again, because this means this problem doesn't scale well on quantum annealing systems. So um, the bigger, so the more electrons you have that you want to simulate, the more space you need on the chip. So, and that's challenging. So now we know this doesn't scale well, but maybe for future implementations of chips. So still, we have the algorithm in place. And this is also what, what I would encourage everyone here to do, um, play around with this system, start developing algorithms. And uh, then hopefully, with future generations of chips, we are able to solve them more efficiently or, or gain something out of it. <clears throat> and here again, I want to show you a very good example um, of a combination of um, classical and quantum algorithms. So what you can see here um, is a simulation of lithium hydride, and here is one of beryllium oxide um, on a quantum annealing system. And uh, what you want to do is, so this black line here represents the full configuration interaction. This is what you really want to simulate, so the exact behavior. And uh, you can see our simulation was a little off. So in here, um, which is the red dots here. So in here, again, it was off as well. 
So, and uh, then the question is, why do it at all? So the idea behind that was, even if I can do a simulation that is a little off, maybe I can do it a lot faster than a classical machine could do it. So, but then still, this doesn't give me any advantage right now because it's not an accurate simulation. So I want the accurate simulation. So, and what you can do then is um, use neural networks and train these on simple systems, so systems that you can classically simulate. Um, but still, the neural network should generalize to systems that it hasn't seen before. So you, you simulate or create this energy curve with a quantum chip that may be a little off, and then you do a quantum error correction, so to say, or a quantum correction with a neural network um, that gives you the exact simulation for examples that it hasn't seen before and that you cannot simulate classically. So again, right now we're not there, but still we have the algorithms in place that could help us to do it. And uh, one last thing. Um, that I want to show you, um, because we're, we're poking around in many different areas that could be interesting. So it's also a little exploration work. Uh, one last thing that I want to show you is um, the finite elements um, design optimization. So what we did here is um, use, um, so triangulate an object. So you could say any, anything, so I want to minimize the weight of an engine block, let's say. So and, uh, you can uh, triangulate that and do a finite elements optimization to minimize any physical, physical quantity. So it could be weight, which could be um, air resistance in a mirror, for example. So anything that could be interesting. So and the thing I can show you here, because everything else is confidential, unfortunately, is a sphere. So we're still, it's the same problem. So what you can see here, this rectangle over there, um, is the area where we um, say um, this is the area where we want to minimize a quantity. Imagine you have an outside mirror of a vehicle and uh, you have wind noise that you want to minimize. So what, you really, what really happens is you have the wind hitting the mirror and uh, this causes vibration and ideally this vibration does not um, create any noise where the driver sits. So we want to create it somewhere else, maybe distribute it ideally. So, and uh, here we made an approximation. We say it instead of um, a spherical sound wave, we do a ray casting problem. So we translated this problem, simplified it into a ray casting problem, which is still very accurate, but it's not the real thing, right? But it's an approximation. So, but this we can embed on a quantum chip. And uh, what you want to achieve here in that case is none of the rays hitting this rectangle, because this rectangle is where the driver sits in that example. So we want to deform the shape such that um, the rays hitting the area, um, this rectangle here, is minimized. And um, so if we look at that, skip over that. So we have the acoustic monopole in that case. We have um, it emitting behind the area. And still, what you could see is a lot of rays going through that rectangle. So this is not what we want. This is what we start with. So, um, but how do you optimally um, preserve the shape of this um, object that you have? So you don't want to end up with a long stick because that wouldn't look like a mirror or wouldn't be a mirror anymore. So still preserve, maximally preserve the shape of the form, but also um, solve the problem such that the quantity that we want to minimize is minimized, which is rays hitting the surface area here. So and this is the result. So still you can see it resembles a sphere, but the design has slightly changed. So and. Um, you would see for, for mirrors or for other parts of vehicles, you get out or you, you obtain some very interesting designs. So if this really ends up in a vehicle, that's another question. But um, at least we can solve it. So that's what, what we were mostly interested in. And um, all right, I think we're running out of time. So that's why I will skip some slides. I just added. Some, some further research directions, not only for us, but maybe for you. So this early field of practical quantum computing, um, I think we should all work together and uh, exchange and, and benefit from the work that others do. So it's, it's too early um, not to talk, I would say. So and, uh, in terms of quantum machine learning, we have some ideas. So we want to apply some quantum algorithms um, for finding, let's say, weights in neural networks. Um, in simulation, still, the material simulations that we have in place are not optimal, so we want to improve that. Um, and in optimization, so anything that's a time-critical optimization problem, which is tool distribution in production, which could be logistics problems, which could be supply chain, so anything that has a time component, um, we want to work on that and see if we can solve it more efficiently with a quantum chip. And one thing to keep in mind is that quantum computers are tools. So if someone else finds a better solution with another tool, well, then we use the other tool because we have a better solution to our problem. But still, um, we give it a try. So that's what we, 
we are mostly after. We can make educated guesses right now and say, I think for this specific problem, I can, I can have quantum advantage, but really, um, very rarely you know it before you try it. So that's the thing. It's too early right now. We don't have programming languages for quantum computers. We still operate on a bit level. We have to represent our problem such that it, it embeds on a, on a graph, so on, on single bits uh, that interact with each other. So there is a lot more that's going to happen in the future, in the near future, and uh, we're very excited about it. Yeah. So I hope this gave a, or I could give you a brief overview of quantum computing and why it would make sense to look at it today and not only in five or ten years. It's because we, we still, or even today, we can we can work on problems and, and generate or create algorithms that may us may help us solve problems in. In, in years, um, or even achieve some quantum advantage today. So even that is possible. So I won't rule that out. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, we actually are out of time, but there are so many questions that I want to take at least a, a few of them. So um, maybe a couple. So the first one, I think you have answered kind of already. What language do you use to program? So Chiang mostly, uh, there are different um, APIs that you could use. But right now, so for us at least, we use Python so to interact with quantum machines. And uh, that's not optimal, because it's not a programming language for quantum computers. You don't have higher so functional languages that give you um, um, the quantum effects directly as a function. So what you would do is really. Um, as I said, operate on a bit level, but mostly for us it's Python mm -hmm. right now. And actually, overall, most questions are about the practicality, so it's still people are in kind of in doubt how practical it is right now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the next question, and actually you can also read it over there, which is kind of critical. When will quantum computers kill all privacy by cracking all existing encryption algorithms? No. So, but we still have to think, or already have to think about it today. So that's also an area that we're active in. So um, right now, we don't have quantum computers um, that can, so you know Shor's algorithm, for example, that you can use to do prime factorization, prime number factorization, so, which would mean that you can crack RSA. But still, what if someone develops a quantum computer that would allow us in 10 years to crack data that someone steals us today? Is that relevant for us? And I would say it is. So that's why we need to look into um, quantum or post-quantum security today, and not only in 10 years. Because in 10 years, every, the whole communication infrastructure of the internet, anything that's encrypted with today's algorithms is in danger. So we have solutions to that. There are algorithm classes that or can withstand quantum attacks. OK. I take the last question, because I guess people are getting hungry. How long do you estimate until a product based on quantum computing will hit the open market? So for us, we hope that sooner than later. And uh, so sooner means so maybe in uh, one or two years. Um, we think that we can, um, so for these mobility problems, for the special purpose computers, we can um, set something in production that, that benefits by being executed on a quantum computer. Um, but we don't know, so maybe not. So, and if not, then we use another algorithm that solves the problem more efficiently. So okay. it's a guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.